Welcome to Breaking Banks. Hey, hey, this is your host, Amber Bucher, and I am so, so excited to share this upcoming segment with you because it revolves around an issue very near and dear to my heart, the incredible but often invisible opportunities that exist to partner with tribal economies. Whether you're a bank, an entrepreneur, or an investor, this conversation has insights for everyone. And to bring us those insights, I'm joined by the inimitable Dawson Hermeny Horses. Dawson is an enrolled member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe of South Dakota. He grew up on the reservation before striking out to attend Columbia and later Dartmouth. He started his career in banking at Merrill Lynch and now serves as the head of Native American banking for Wells Fargo. Wells is a leading provider of capital for the Native American and Alaska Native markets. They bank four out of 10 federally recognized tribes in the U.S., and that equates to about $3 billion in credit commitments and $3.9 billion in, ad- in deposits. Dawson and I are digging into Wells' new report on Indian countries once in a seven generations opportunity in what's sure to be an eye-opening conversation that you won't want to miss. Hello, I am so excited to be joined here today by Dawson Hermeny Horses. As I described in the introduction, Dawson and I have crossed paths quite a bit over the last year or so. Um, and I met Dawson first in person at the Native American Financial Officers Association. He was speaking there and had a lot of great, great words and wisdom to share. And I knew I had to have him on the show. So Dawson, thank you so much for coming on. It's it's great to have you. Thank you so much, Amber. I'm excited to be here. So Great. Well, so I'd love to hear before we dive into the report that Wells Fargo recent release, re- recently released, I'd love to hear a little bit about you, Dawson. Can you tell our listeners a bit about your work at Wells Fargo, any sort of volunteering that you do, and overall just what what gets you going? What, what are you passionate about as a person? Sure. Um, again, just really excited to be here, excited to talk about this work, our report, but also, you know, just talk about Native American finance a little more broadly. Um you know, I grew up on the Rosebud Reservation. Both of my parents are Lakota. My dad is Ogallala from Pine Ridge. I'm from, my mom is from Rosebud. I'm enrolled in, in Rosebud. And I think, you know, I grew up with the idea, with the goal of wanting to kind of give back to my community. Both my parents uh, were the first to graduate from there uh, and their families to graduate from college and kind of impressed onto me the importance of doing something like that. And so I, I, uh, Got my start in finance, uh, not because I wanted to kind of go into finance. Uh, I I wanted to go into law school and thought that um, getting an internship at Merrill Lynch in New York City would be a good, and their their office of general counsel would be look good on my law school application. And that kind of turned into a, um, you know, just a career in finance, right? And I think what I realized is that there just aren't a lot of natives, as as you know, uh, in finance. Right. And so I think there's an opp- a lot of opportunity to kind of be a bridge between, you know, uh, tribal communities and the finance world. Right. And I think, um, you know, I've, I've had a lot of opportunity to not only just work on deals, but also kind of elevate issues and talk about things that are uh, happening in tribal communities from a finance and accounting perspective that, that need to be addressed and that need to kind of be elevated and kind of examined. And so it's been, for me, it's been kind of, uh, I've been very fortunate to be able to kind of work, have, have, you know, get a paycheck, but also kind of talk about things that I think are really important, you know, to our community. And, and I think this report is part of, as a part of that. So. That's great. So you didn't end up going to law school. I think you ended up going to law school now. So there's probably well, people tell me there's a lot of Native American lawyers. So, you know, we don't need, you know, one more. So yeah, there's plenty of us as a recovering attorney myself. I can okay. vouch for that. So <laughs> I think you took the right path. Um, that That's great to hear. And, and can you tell us a little bit more about your role at Wells Fargo and specifically what it is that you do there? Yeah, so, you know, I joined Wells Fargo um, just over four years ago, and so I'm a part of a team called the Diverse Segments Team, and I think um, our mandate is to, um, you know, generate more business in diverse communities, um, you know, for our commercial banking group, and and within that team, um, I'm the head of Native American Banking, you know, for Wells Fargo, and I build our business strategy and then work with bankers um, across our platform who uh, either have Native American clients, tribal clients, um, and we define tribal clients being tribal governments and tribal owned businesses, um, or, or bankers who wanna like um, prospect um, and, and do more, right? I think as a bank, we, we do quite a bit already, but there are regions of the country where 
um, you know, we just uh, don't have as much presence, right? So the central region of the U.S., I think, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for us there, and that's where we've been spending a lot of our time. Um, but I've been doing this for four years now, and I think, um, you know, uh, it's it's been great. My background has is, is been in, in gaming, right? I've been, I was a gaming banker for many years at a competitor bank um, before joining Wells Fargo, and I think the thing that attracted me um, you know, to this particular role to Wells Fargo is that, you know, I think as a company, you know, we're really interested in um, not just kind of focusing on tribal gaming, but also tribal governments, you know, non-gaming businesses. And I think if you want to be, if you say you're committed to a community, right, I think you need to be interested in kind of um, doing business with all segments of that, right? And so I think that was a big driver for me. And I think more recently, I've been focused on trying to kind of update our credit strategy and, and, and help uh, Wells Fargo um, respond to kind of concerns um, and desires among tribal leaders to, to find more non-gaming business opportunities. And so we've been looking at our, our credit strategy, and I've been working to kind of update that to make sure that we're able to address some of those requests that we get. So. Awesome. That sounds like important work and a lot of educating your peers, I'm sure. And we'll dive into that for sure as a part of this conversation. Um, but first, let's talk a little bit about the report. So for those of you who um, did not catch it, uh, Wells Fargo released Indian Country's Once in a Seven Generation Opportunity Report last month in October, um, Building Economic Resiliency That Sticks. And this is a really interesting report because it covered a range of topics from gaps in data and reporting on tri tribal governments and economies um, to some of the digital desert challenges that our communities have. And then it really goes into a lot of opportunities that several different major sectors have to partner with tribes um, in a way that is impactful and um, rewarding for, for all parties involved and talked about um, different things that the government and financial institutions and other, you know, uh, private sector folks can do to start working with uh, native native uh, communities. And so the the big goal of the report, as I understood it, and, and the title of the report uh, is to present a once in seven generations opportunity to reimagine Indian country and how it could position itself economically which is so powerful. Um, but it's a concept that I realized not many people are actually familiar with. So Dawson, I'd love if we could start just talking about that concept of the seven generations, what that means to some of our native cultures and what that means to you personally. Yeah, I think it's a it's a great call out, right? Because I think uh, I've been spending some time thinking about it. Um, you know, I think uh, it's, it's, it's common in a lot of tribal communities. You'll hear it, you know, at conferences, you read about it. Um, you know, I think the, the the idea behind sort of this seven generation concept is that you know today, as as leaders in our own, you know, formally or informally, right? Um, you know, we always need to think about the future, right? We always kind of need to think about how the decisions that we're making today um, uh, will impact not only like ourselves and and kind of our peers and our families, but also just our communities, you know, and then our communities not only today but in the future. Right, and I think that idea of seven generations is to kind of um, uh, it, it kind of I think the intention is to prompt us to think about the future, right? And, and the the it, it, the idea is to kind of just make sure that we're making decisions that aren't short sighted, right? To make uh, and, and uh, prompt us, uh, push us to think about how the decisions that we're making will impact, you know, ourselves, our communities, um, uh, the natural environment right um resources right and um you know i think it's one that is is kind of meant to uh, prompt a lot of reflection right and encourage people to think about um what does it mean to kind of make this decision what are the impacts and and you know who should be involved in kind of this decision making process and and you know I was, one of the things that i was thinking about is when i was a kid growing up in rosebud on the rosebud reservation one of the things that i always heard is you are the seventh generation Right. And I don't think they meant like, you know, seven generations ago, someone came up with this concept and, and today I'm the seventh generation. I don't think that's what they meant. I think what they meant was like, we're all the seventh generation. Right. At some point, you know, years ago, you know, people were thinking about the future. Right. And, and um, thinking about, you know, how the decisions they're making 
uh, uh, we're going to impact, you know, some future um, relative. And so I think for me, you know, what I think about is like, you know, what are the decisions that I'm going to be making, right, that are going to affect, um, you know, what is the uh, the legacy, right? Because somebody made a decision, somebody many years ago was praying for me, right, before I even knew it. Right. And praying for my health and my survival and, and my community. And so I think if I'm the seventh generation, like what am I doing today to kind of like do the same for the for, for the few the, the people who are going to come after me? Right. And so I think for me, that's what it means is that I'm the seventh generation. I need to think about like the future and, and I have a responsibility, right, to do that for the future. I think that's that's the key, the key term is right, responsibility, right? Um, to make sure that um you know, we're thinking about our communities, our families, and, and our culture. Responsibility, for sure. It's something that I know I feel, too, very uh, attuned to. And I think it's something that a lot of the bankers listening to the show probably do as well, especially when you think about family-owned banks. Um, you know, they definitely tend to think in terms of literal generations of a family. Um, but, you know, I think that banks that have a good um, tether to that reality and that responsibility are less likely to fall into some of the traps that we've seen other institutions fall into, whether that's, you know, short excited trying to get in on this or that lending trend or, or, you know, follow this or that credit standard that may be in vogue at the moment, but, um, but could, could have real dangers in the long term. So I think that's definitely a concept that applies to a lot of folks that are, you know, listening today and trying to build their organizations in a thoughtful way. Um, so one of the first things that the report touched on that was, again, really interesting and, and touched me very personally was uh, it talked a lot about just the lack of data that's available when we're looking at Indian country. And it's something that, you know, I've experienced when I was trying to build Totem, which is a, a digital bank for natives that we're launching next year. Um it was really difficult to get information on tribal economies, tribally owned businesses um, that I needed to help paint a picture for investors of what it would look like for us to be working within Indian country. So can you talk a little bit about why those gaps exist? Like, what is it about tribal economies that's a little bit different? Um, and what what does that lack of data mean in terms of impact when people are looking to invest in, in native owned um, businesses, economies? Yeah, I think it's, um, I'm so glad that, that I'm not the only one that had this experience, right? I think, um, you know, we've done a lot of work in tribal communities. We have relationships with four out of 10 fairly recognized tribes at Wells Fargo. But one of the things that, you know, I encountered is, you know, when I asked for um, some more resources to do some of the work that I do here at Wells Fargo, you know, some of our leaders said, uh, show us the opportunity. Right. And I know there's opportunity in, you know, with tribal governments and tribal enterprises. I know where it's at. I know uh, where we have strong relationships, where we don't. Um, but what occurred to me when they prompted that, uh, asked that question was like, uh, you know, I wasn't sure where to go to look for data. So we went and, and kind of uh, scoured kind of federal resources. I reached out to folks that I know uh, at accounting firms and, 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 and other kind of uh, institutions that work with tribal governments to kind of get some ideas of how I could come up with this information. And, and you know, um, I couldn't find any. Right. I couldn't find any data. And, and, you know, the way that we define, you know, Native American markets and, and the way that, I, that, that uh, we, the, the clients that we're looking for are tribal governments and tribal owned enterprises. And, you know, we just couldn't find much. And so what, what we wound up doing is just um, uh, using a lot of data that we found uh, from federal uh, sources. There's, there's, there's some, you know, public uh, information about tribal governments and tribal enterprises. There's not much on individual tribal members. Um, and so we kind of used that uh, as a proxy and kind of uh, mapped together a bunch of uh, data for years, um, uh, uh, you know, for, for gaming, for um, oil and gas, uh, water, you know, timber, kind of put it together in a report. And then we were able to kind of back into some estimates about, you know, some of the prospects that we had. And so it was this very time intensive process. And what I realized is that like, if I'm having like trouble finding this and I know how governments are structured, the industries that they're focused in, what must it be like, you know, for somebody who has no exposure to tribal communities, who doesn't understand it. And so as we were doing this report and working with the Boston Consulting Group on it, you know, we asked them to kind of consider the, add this section to this, to this uh, report, because I just felt like it, it's, it's so important. We live in a data world, right? 
and um, so many decisions that we make uh, and, and kind of the corporate world are based on data, right? We need to kind of make the business case for doing something. And, and so, um, you know, our goal is that by talking about this and, and I wrote an op-ed about this, um, you know, last week in uh, the U.S. News and World Report, where we kind of, you know, explored a little further. My hope is that we can kind of start to elevate some of these issues and get folks to start talking about them with the goal of eventually, eventually doing some sort of economic reporting that helps investors and people who don't understand the Indian country, maybe even more banks, right? I don't want to, I don't want any more competition, but I think, you know, um, you know, I think there are a lot of places where, you know, um, the tribes don't have capital, right? And, and um, to the extent that we can get more information and data about tribal communities that respects tribal confidentiality, you know, the, the financial information of, of individuals with tribes, I think it's, it's better for our community because we can have Better banking services, or tribal individual tribal members can have, um, you know, a more access to you know uh, banks and, and products that they need, and and not have to rely on check cashing and you know other other things. So there's like multiple implications, but I think this is just one issue that's just so fundamental to kind of how we do business that really needs to kind of be elevated and discussed. Yeah, absolutely, and. Well, first of all, happy to help in any way I possibly can <laughs> with whatever initiatives you come up with. Um, and it, you know, it kind of goes back to that saying of like, if you can't see it, you can't be it. It's kind of right. like that. But if you can't see a tribal economy for what it is, you can't see the opportunity there um, that you as a financial institution or a partner could have. Um, and so, yeah, the, that lack of data definitely um, is something that We'll, we'll we'll work on it. We'll keep finding solutions yeah. to it, backing into it however we can. I know there are a lot of really smart people working on this. Um, you know, Casey Lozar and his team down at the Minneapolis Fed doing a lot of great work on that. So stay tuned. We'll have more data <laughs> as as the seventh generation progresses, let's say. <laughs> um, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say just on that, I mean, I think, you know, Casey and I and, and some folks at the Aspen Institute are actually working on and this week we'll be hosting kind of a, the, the first discussion on this issue. We're, we're um, going to be meeting in Washington, D.C. and we're bringing together like private sector folks, some federal officials and some tribal leaders to kind of start a conversation about, you know, why this why this situation exists and kind of maybe kind of start to map out like what the issues are, what are the current sources of, of data and, and start talking about what, what can we do about it? Right. And so we're going to be doing that on um, this Wednesday. Um, and so I'm really excited about it. It's, it's kind of like, uh, uh, I've never done anything like this before. You know, I'm a private sector person kind of bringing together these other folks. So it's, it's a little different, but I think it's a conversation that, that needs to take place. And my hope is that, we can um, get people to kind of start talking about why this doesn't, why this issue exists and, and maybe build some momentum and have, you know, some further conversations, which I think you would be great to, 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 to participate in, um, you know, after this. Because I think, as, like I said, I, I understand there's a lot of sensitivities around uh, data and, and, and tribal data. And, and I'm hoping that we can get into a robust discussion about this on Wednesday. But, you know, I think it comes at a cost. Right. If we don't share data, right, if we're not sharing it at some level that folks can see, you know, um, it's going to be harder to kind of make the business case for, you know, more, more, more banks and credit unions and, and things like that in any country and as well as any other business that wants to expand into, into any country. So, Well, speaking of talking about more banks and and financial institutions and things like that moving into Indian country. I thought it was so interesting that the port na the report named all of these traditional FIs, native owned banks, CDFIs or community development financial institutions. Um, and, and all of those together made for what the report called a cluttered landscape of financial services providers. But there are still a lot of gaps, as you alluded to earlier, when it comes to accessing financial services for Native populations. So can you talk so about some of those gaps and and how we have so many providers and yet so many gaps still? Yeah, I mean, I think one way that I think about it, yeah, so so the, the report kind of um, will spend some time and, and you'll see a great graphic that kind of represents, right, um, the traditional pools of capital that are available in mainstream America. And it kind of looks at... Um, and identify some of those institutions that, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, participate in, in, you know, things like commercial banking and, and you have national banks, regional banks, CDFIs, things like that. And so, um, 
to me, what's interesting about it is, you know, just kind of when I put my banking hat on, take off my travel member hat, put on my banking hat, right? When you think about the evolution of a company, right? And it starts off as a small business and, and kind of grows and, and matures and, and becomes more sophisticated and becomes, you know, something large and big that kind of goes public. You know, I think there's like a, there's, there's um, a financial institution, right? Or a, a pool of capital. Let me put it um, for each of those, you know, phases of growth. And I think what we found is that, you know, there are places where, you know, we have um, mature businesses, strong businesses that have, you know, recurring cash flow. You know, those are those are um, places where we see most of of kind of banking activity, right? When we think about, you know, you know, travel casinos are kind of what everybody knows. I don't want to default to that, but that, that's kind of what everybody knows. You know, those are mature businesses. They're the businesses that have been around for a while, have cash flows. So those are easy for banks to see, right? Those are easy for those kinds of pools of capital to see. But when you think about like those, those entrepreneurs, those smaller businesses, right? Like that's where we see a lot of the gaps, right? We see that like, you know, within sort of the venture growth, you know, uh, private equity space, there just isn't as much there, right? And I think, I mean, part of my theory is that part of part of the reason that exists is one, you know, tribes are are you know we're just invisible, right? We're we're economically invisible, as we say in the report, we've been, as we've been discussing, you know, as we've been talking to people about it. But I think, you know, I also think there's kind of a misunderstanding in, in tribal of of how tribal communities operate, right? In mainstream America, it's the entrepreneurs that. Um, you know, uh, get a lot of the uh, attention. They're the ones that start the businesses, that create the companies, right? And that's kind of how everybody stand, uh, kind of understands it. But in, in, in tribal communities in Native America, it's a little bit different. We have tribal governments are the big actors with sort of the businesses they own. And, and I think what happens sometimes is that, you know, um, when people do think of us, we see those and we don't see the smaller businesses. And so, you know, I think that invisibility is what leads to these different pools of capital not being or finding, you know, opportunities in tribal communities. Like, I mean, I think about the venture world because everybody who's, you know, we were just talking about this last week, right? They're just, they're just on a lot of natives kind of represented in that space or a lot of, you know, startups or, or kind of businesses that kind of get that capital. And I think, I think that's, um, that's to, to their detriment as investors, right? But I think it's, you know, it has an impact on us, right? you know, and then entrepreneurs that want to kind of do this work. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And the report calls the the VC, you know, pool of capital out specifically. It said that it's lack of engagement may be ascribed to a lack of connections combined with minimal comprehension of tribal dynamics. So again, funneling right into what you just described. And again, this is something that I experienced personally when I was raising the pre-seed round for Totem. Um, every time I was talking to a more traditional VC or a Silicon Valley VC, I would spend a majority of our time just sort of educating them about what it means to be native, what a reservation is, the fact that we still exist in some instances. Um, and it's really detrimental because it it doesn't allow a native entrepreneur like myself to have the same level of conversation about the business that we would be having if I were anyone else. Um, so I'm curious, what advice would you give to VC firms that might be listening? Because we do have a lot of investors that listen to the show about how to connect with folks in Indian country and how to think about the opportunities that our communities provide um, that could give VCs a real edge. Yeah, I mean, I think I mean, to, to the point that you just made, I mean, I think to be native is to be an educator, right? And that's that's good and bad, right? Um, but I think my advice to kind of VCs and others who are interested in the space is that, like, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity here, right? And I think that, um, you know, uh, if you don't know where to look, I think our community is small enough that, like, if you have kind of someone or our, our, our foothold, you know, someone that you can talk to about it, like we can probably get, get you connected in some way, right? I mean, I think, Amber, I, I heard about, like, I knew you were doing the podcast, but I wasn't sure. I didn't know you were working on Totem, for example. And I think somebody shared that with me and and uh, that I thought that was pretty cool, right? And so I think our world is kind of small enough that like, if you're looking for opportunities that we can get, we can kind of direct you. I mean, I just got a, a LinkedIn request from a native student who wants to work in banking, right? And he was like, I heard you, somebody told me to, you know, so I just talked to somebody and they told me to reach out to you. And so I get those requests all the time, right? And so I think if you're 
interested in this space, like, I think you just need to kind of start exploring and I think it'll be pretty easy to kind of start identifying, you know, who you need to talk to and, and identify where the opportunities are. So. Yeah, I would say I, I, I totally agree. I think that we're generally a pretty, uh, open bunch if you you know are able to put yourselves in the in the places that we are and the conversations that we're having in an authentic way i think we're always happy to make connections and it is a pretty small world i think we intersect at like probably six different degrees of separation um so that that's great advice to just kind of just ask and and we'll show you um One of the other issues that the report brought up that I'm actually really excited about is um, the forthcoming changes that we're expecting to the Community Reinvestment Act or the CRA. Um, uh, Lots of incentives to get national banks to participate with tribal economies. Um, That's something that we've been looking at at Totem as well, how we can partner with banks um, for CRA initiatives. Can you talk a little bit about what you see coming down the pike in terms of CRA revitalization and what that means to Indian countries? tribal communities sure yeah and i think it's it's this modernization i think is is a really unique opportunity and and my hope is that you know um whatever rules kind of uh, get pushed out i know this is actually the kind of the second attempt at cr cra modernization i think there was a um, some rules that were issued um by, by i think maybe the occ without some of the other regulatory um bodies uh, engagement and so i think this one is kind of a, another attempt to kind of bring everybody together to talk about how uh, they can impact um you know the the different communities that financial institutes institute and operate in what, what i'm really excited about um actually the first attempt and even this attempt is that you know i, th- I feel like tribes tribal governments um tribal communities are really engaged in a way that they were uh, uh engaged um much more than they were, you know, around the original kind of rulemaking, right? I've seen so much more outreach and engagement um, from OCC, from FDIC, from the Federal Reserve on trying to make sure that they get input on um, issues, definitions, right? I'm, I'm the chair of the co-chair or the chair of the uh, NFO's uh, Corporate Advisory Committee, and we hosted a meeting with some regulators where we brought them in to kind of talk to um, some of our 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 members who are, you know, financial institutions and, and uh, they were asking questions around, um, you know, just trying to understand the business a little more, right? And so I think overall, my goal, is, my hope is that this this process, the rules that come out uh, will be much more inclusive and, and, and much more flexible, I think, um, you know, uh, when it comes to kind of getting credit uh, for kind of supporting tribal communities. Um, I'm not sure what they're going to do, right? I'm not, I, I'm not sure where they are in the process, but I'm not sure which rules they're going to actually, you know, push out. But my hope is that when it comes to getting credit, they'll give financial institutions more flexibility to get credit maybe out of their, their tra- traditional CRA. I'm not sure what the right term is, like zone or their kind of geography footprint. Um, because I think, uh, you know, we, we need more support in tribal communities from kind of the traditional banks, right? And I think to the extent that these rules can do that, I think it, it's good for everyone. It's good for banks. It's good for Indian country. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that dovetails really nicely into kind of the the final um, sort of suggestions or next steps that the report called out for three main groups. So I think some of the big takeaways were for tribes, um, they can start executing on high potential opportunities like bridging the digital divide, which we didn't even get a chance to talk about yet, but a lot of lack of access to basic infrastructure like broadband and things like that can really help um, help our people. Uh, two was for national banks that can start partnering with other capital providers to provide funding and share technology. And then the third big bucket was governments and really helping to establish public-private partnerships to build out projects. So can you tell us a little bit more about some of those suggestions? What are some of the ideas and next steps that you think hold the most promise? Yeah, so I think, you know, I think what's interesting about the report is that there's a little bit in it. There's, there's something in it for everybody. Right. And I think um, when I think about the audience for the report, there there are three. I think there are tribal leaders who the report was kind of geared to. And I think you see that towards the end. We there are a lot of different frameworks. Uh the report gives tribal leaders frameworks to kind of think about different diversification opportunities. Right. I think 
Um, there's there's uh, stuff in there for the private sector, right? So we talk about what banks and others, as you mentioned, uh, can do to kind of get more engaged in tribal communities. And then there's some stuff in there, I think, for for um, you know policymakers, right? So you see the discussion around broad, broadband. I think this data fits nicely into that as well, because I think if we start collecting data, it's probably going to be in, uh, need to include you know. Uh, federal departments, federal agencies, because they do that a lot of that work already, in addition to kind of having a trust responsibility uh, to, to travel community. So there's a little bit in it for everyone. Um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, next steps, you know, I think the ones, the, the, the one that that is, I think, probably the most meaningful to me, and I think the one that I think where we can have a lot of the impact is just really going to be on the data. Right, I think that that's I think that's probably going to take the longest, right? But I feel like that's um, I think that's a conversation that we just haven't had. Kind of, we, I think there's a as we've started to prepare for this event on Wednesday. What I realized is like a lot of small groups are having this, these conversations, but I think as a as a larger community, we haven't done that yet. We haven't explored why. You know, there, there may be some sensitivities. We haven't talked about the trade offs. We haven't talked about the opportunities that come with it, and so. Uh, for me, I think that's that's the most meaningful one, and then I think the others, the others are really important as well. I think um, you know we, we're coming out of the pandemic, but also kind of are in this interesting time. Are we you know in a in a recession? Are we not right? And so this report kind of gives tribal leaders and and you know tribal bus uh, uh, business uh, leaders things to think about um, and and and. Um, some guidance on kind of how what they can do to prepare themselves uh, through different opportunities, you know, for times like this. So I think there's a lot in there, you know, and I think uh, my hope is that folks kind of read it. I'm happy to talk to anybody who wants to talk about it, um, but you know, it's it's um, you know, it's it's a read, so good read, so. Good read. Very good read. And and definitely the theme that I think came through most clearly with the report was this this theme of resiliency, um, economic resiliency, resiliency coming out of the pandemic. There were some great stories in the report about how tribal communities really excelled at, you know, taking care of their people and in the midst of the COVID pandemic. Um, and resiliency for for our people as a whole. So for listeners who may not know, I'm Choctaw Enrolled Member, um, and we're recording this in Native American Heritage Month here in November, um, the week before Native American People's Day on November 25th. And so it's it's just a really incredible time to be having this conversation with you, Dawson, someone who has led so much good, positive work um, for Native communities. So what final word would you leave with the bankers, entrepreneurs, investors that are listening in the audience today? What what can they do to support some of the work that you've been sharing with us today? So I think, you know, I think the report, one of the big findings from the report is that, um, you know, tribal communities uh, are, are economically invisible, right? But I think practical experience, I think anybody who uh, is in a part of the country where tribes are located, right, will know that um, that we're not invisible, right? And, and in many places like Oklahoma, you know, uh, I've been to the Choctaw Reservation, I've been to Durant, right? Um, you know, we're, uh, our, our governments, our, the businesses, our tribes own, we're contributors to the, the economies of the regions we work in. Right, we employ natives and non-natives. Right, we uh, uh, give back. We're you know good corporate citizens. So I would say you know if you're interested in, in, in getting involved, you know there's a lot of uh, interest and focus right now on doing that. Like the OCC is leading some initiatives through their Project Reach effort to kind of bring more banks into uh, supporting um, and giving and providing more capital to diverse communities. So I think if you're interested in doing something like that, if you want to get involved, I would say reach out to you know, your regulators, right? Because they're trying to do more to kind of um, do that. But I also would just encourage you to do research, right? If, if you know, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of traditional bank uh, lending activity that we think of when we think of banks, but there's also a lot of ways that you can help through uh, philanthropic giving, right? You know, a lot of banks have foundations. If your bank has a CRA, uh, uh, a new market tax credit allocation, right? Tribes are very active in that. We, our team has done a lot of uh, lending through that. 
you know, recruiting, you know, maybe you can't do lending, maybe you can't do new market tax credit or philanthropy, but, you know, um, you can recruit natives, right? Like there's a lot of places like Oklahoma where there are a lot of native students who need jobs, right? And I think, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, we all, we're all interested in hiring and when we want to hire diverse candidates, right? So, you know, uh, you can win more, you can give more, right? You can hire more natives, right? There's a lot of different ways, you know, you can get engaged. And so um, I guess the final thing is, that, you know, come to NAFOA, right? NAFOA is kind of like, a really great uh, venue, come to their fall or spring conference. And I think you'll really get a good introduction to kind of some of the issues that are impacting tribal communities. You'll see a lot of like the people who are a lot of the decision makers and centers of influence and really kind of get a sense of like, um, what really what community, you know, Native American finance is, right? You know, it's, it's we all kind of know each other, right? Uh, we all want to help. I think from a banking perspective, like all the bankers that I work with, um, and most of them are non-native uh, who cover our travel clients, they'll tell you they love doing this because they see the impact, right? They know the impact that the loan they gave to the travel loan, their travel casino client, they know the impact that will have on the travel government, right? Because those, the, the profits from that casino go back to the travel government and, and, and fund important things like housing, healthcare, um, you know, language preservation, elder care, right? They see that. And so, you know, a lot of the people who work in this space, you know, want to improve our, like you, want to improve our community and then ensure like more access to financial services. And so if you want to come, I think you want to do more. And in addition to kind of the steps I just gave, just come to one of these conferences and you'll kind of get a, a sense and flavor of, of, you know, what, it, what you know, our community needs. But, you know, um, you know, just uh, who we are as as a people and as nations. So, oh, Dawson, you make me so proud to be who I am, and um, yeah, just doing such incredible work. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show today. For those of you who missed it, NAFO is the Native American Financial Officers Association. I'll be there. Dawson will be there. Get the new Wells Fargo report. Indian Country's once in a seven generation opportunity. And we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for being here, Dawson. Thanks for having me. It was great. When things go up, they also have a Newtonian way of coming down. Neobanks such as Chime, New Bank, Klarna, Revolut, they were rocket ships that have now had to pull IPOs and take massive valuation haircuts. Does this signal the end of neobanking? Amber Buker, formerly my partner at Alloy Labs, where she led Strategic Insights, decided a global economic meltdown was the perfect time to start, wait for it, a neobank. Let's find out what her strategic insight was. Tune in. It is not as crazy as it sounds. She even convinced Alloy Labs Alchemist Fund to invest. That's both a disclosure and a vote of confidence. Well, Amber, I'm glad that you are still a host for Breaking Banks because introducing Amber Buker, formerly known as the artist <laughs> that was head of insights for Alloy Labs, but you've flown the nest or the coop as the case may be to go off and in all things, go start a challenger bank. Why of all times would you want <laughs> to go leave and start a neobank now? And maybe we should start with what's wrong with neobanks? Like you have a crisp mind on this. Like what's wrong with the system of neobanks as we see them today? And then we'll get into what uh, you're actually setting off to accomplish. Yeah, so I think the concept of a neobank, a challenger bank, an affinity bank, an identity-focused bank in our case um, is a really beautiful concept that creates community in a digital space, which I think is something that we're all looking for more and more. Um, but the fatal flaw, if you will, I think in a lot of neobank models is that they rely solely on interchange revenue, which I'm sure that you talked about with, with everyone before me. Um, I like to say interchange is subject to change and therefore is not um, something that you can really stake a you know multi-year, hopefully multi-generational business on. And so we've tried to kind of create a more anti-fragile business model that doesn't rely solely on that. But then, you know, when we're thinking like, okay, well, what else can we do to make money as a bank that's not interchange? Um, we really took it back to our founding story and what was important to us so that we were aligning these other revenue opportunities with our mission and our vision for what Totem would be. 
And where that founding story started was with me trying to access tribal benefits. Um, it was in my case, it was a down payment assistance program that was really difficult to find, difficult to find anyone that knew about it. Um, and then when I started to get more into this world of understanding these benefits and what's available, I started to realize how the tribes are actually dispersing the benefits is also a pain point for them. And so we started to think, okay, well, how can we build wealth in the native community based on these assets that they already should have access to and clear up that pain point for the tribes? Well, there we go. Now we have some real revenue opportunity to provide value in a way that is you know, increasing access to benefits for our customers and also making the process of administering and distributing those benefits easier for the tribe. And now we have a B2B model and in some cases a B2B2C model in terms of the tribes actually acting as our distribution partners for these accounts um, that is much stronger than like a typical just direct to consumer play. Well, and I loved you know, part of you know this story in how it fits is affinity is not enough. Like I like this idea of like, hey, we all crave affinity. I'm not willing to pay for affinity. And, you know, in most cases, it has to be tangible value. And that's what you hooked me with in the totem story was there is value provided to each one of the stakeholders in this, whether it's the tribe that right now is sending, you know, a paper check, maybe an ACH, but Native Americans are some of the most severely underbanked out there. I mean, surprised you don't trust the system after you know, <laughs> right. your tribal lands have been stolen and just about every treaty has been broken. What's wrong? Um, There's no generational trauma there. No, definitely no, not. No, <laughs> no. Um, clearly. Yeah. And so, you know, this value, like it really is the story of you're taking friction out of the system and that creates the opportunity for everyone benefits by doing this. It's not paying for a metal card. Or, you know, paying because I, I want to put my own picture on the card or feeling, right. you know, like literally and figuratively, I'm part of a tribe that, you know, this is more than just identity. It's value creation. Exactly. Um, it has to be something other than like a fun service that makes you feel like you're a part of a club. I think we've had that model for so long. And to your point about like buying the metal cards, like <laughs> there are just so many things. Uh, we can talk about this. I was tweeting the other day with someone that if, uh, it, you know, there was the first Neobank for pet owners launch. It's like, listen, yeah. <laughs> I can actually get behind this. You launch a Chewy.com rewards program, I'm in. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Really, of all times? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we're going to use this screenshot okay. that okay. For everyone should know this is Amber's <laughs> puppy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the puppy horse. Um no, but it, you know, so having, having this alignment between not just having an account that says, Hey, this is who I am. This actually helps me self-actualize in many cases. Um, they're, you know, native Americans are the fastest growing racial demographic group on the census. We had a 160% population jump from the 2010 to the 2020 census. So it's a huge growing group. And this allows people to not only self-identify and say, this is another stake in the ground where I'm connecting with and claiming my culture, but it's also giving me access to, you know, again, like these tangible benefits and, and opportunities to connect with my heritage um, that other folks are, are not, you know, the other folks, it's really hard to create products around just a single affinity. Um, yep. Whereas when, when we're talking about your heritage, there are so many factors of that. We have a really long roadmap that includes products like a powwow finder and a charitable giving piece that will allow you to give to native charities. I mean, the list goes on and on in terms of ways that we can engage that are meaningful and deep and you know different than than just a, a cool card with the right like picture on it. Well, I mean, I do have a picture of Lola, my golden retriever, on my uh, Capital One card, which is even though it's expired, it's I still carry it. But you know, that just goes to show how often I use that card. Um, right, right. Right. So when you were bringing this together, and it was important to you to round out the team with other Native Americans, and as you were road testing this and running the idea, I'm curious what the reaction was from you know some of the people that you, you brought the idea to. 
Yeah. So we did a concept test really early on um, when we were just kicking around the idea of, is this something that we should even think about doing? Um, you know, I, I've seen a lot of neobanks and I was one of the people who believed that we were completely oversaturated in that market. So I wanted to make sure that I was you know, creating something potentially that people would actually want. We did a quick concept test. And um, what we found was that the reaction was really overwhelmingly positive. Over 90% of people loved, quote unquote, or liked the concept. Um, 88% of our concept test respondents uh, requested email updates from us throughout throughout the lifespan as we build. And then 60% of the folks who did the test for us signed up for our account waiting list. And so, um, you know, we were, we were building an account wait list, you know, just a few months into planning, which was really exciting. And what we learned from that was that it, it really was because of who and, and what we are. So we kind of positioned this as, as banking by and for natives. And that was the number one thing that stuck out to people. We were talking about, you know, a spot me feature and a fee free account and all of these other kind of little features that we added to the test. Um, and people liked some of those, but far and away, the number one thing that people talked about in the qualitative responses was, Hey, you know, I bank with, Chase or Wells or one of these big nationals. And the only reason I do it is because they have a good app and I can get ATM access anywhere. But if it weren't for those things, I would never bank with them. I don't want to bank with them. I don't like that I have to bank with them. And so we found over and over again that just the fact that this was specific to our people and a brand that they could ostensibly trust was what won people over and made them really want to see this product come to life. Um, so, you know, it's not just the unbanked folks that we're targeting, although that's definitely a big part of our mission is to get more natives banked. We're the largest group of unbanked people in the country when you're looking at race and ethnicity. Um, about 16% of natives nationwide are unbanked. That bore out in our concept test as well. About 15.6 were unbanked of the folks that we surveyed. But what made us really excited was another 11% were already using a digital only bank. And then the rest were split out 50 50 between credit union and community bank users and those big national players. And so we feel like we have a really great opportunity to, to win market share from you know, not just folks that are already unbanked, but folks that are already yeah. digitally banking and big national customers. Yeah. Well, for the unbanked, to me, the opportunity there is when you're working with the tribe that wants to replace prepaid and um, you know sending paper checks, you know, that have a tendency to get lost in the mail or addresses, you know, change and there's breakage and it's bad for everyone. You know, this is what Hire One built their business on, as you and I've talked about, around how do you solve the problem for the university that needs to get student loan money into the hands of students, right? There is a natural wedge there, and it's bigger than, let's just make it prettier, right? It's not about prettier. Yeah. It's actually real value and a cost savings for a number of them. Now, was anyone anti the idea? Like you would said, you know, of the 66, did you get any negative feedback? Uh, we had literally like two people say that they would not open the account. <laughs> um, so, so there wasn't a ton of, um, backlash or negativity. I think, um, you know, in terms of, of our customer base, we do have some significant trust issues to, um, to address. And so, you know, I think that a lot of the the kind of naysayers, if you will, um, were just like, you know, who are these people sending me this survey? Like, I don't even know you. Like, why would I do this? It, it doesn't seem real um, or it seems like you might be like getting taken for a ride or whatever. Um, and so I, I truly think that the few naysayers that we had, once they see that this is a real product that is built by real native people and we can show them something tangible, um, that, that it'll, it'll make sense for them. And, and I have every confidence that we will win them over. Yeah. I'm trying to think about naysayers, you know, it's interesting when we talk to tribal leaders, um, a lot of them get it immediately and they love the idea of having, um, particularly kind of the financial literacy piece built in and getting more people banked. But, uh, of some of them, we, we tend to always run into folks that have some sort of tribally owned bank, financial service, payday lending product. And so, um, for those, you know, for those folks, it's a little bit different conversation of figuring out like, okay, well, how can we partner? You know, if you have a, a responsible, you know, financial product, is there a way yep. that we can talk about getting it in front of people? Um, and, you know, figuring those things out, but 
the reason why we're doing this is because there's a huge gap in mm. terms of service for this market. There are 30 native owned banks in the entire country. So that's, you know, not a lot of banks and and the ones that are out there, um, they're typically smaller in terms of their geographic footprint. They've got like maybe one or two branches. Um, they may have a consumer app, but it's, you know, like Jack Henry version 2018, um, or they, they technically have a bank, but it's really just kind of a mortgage operation, or it's really just kind of a CDFI Mm. or, you know, whatever the case is. So in terms of having an actual national brand that is for FDIC insured chartered accounts, um, you know, there really is a, a big gap in Indian country for that. So you, it's kind of a natural progression in your career, right? At bank director you really followed the, you know, the industry and, you know, frequently published on it. You come to Alloy Labs. Now you spend a lot more time working on bank and fintech partnerships, including a lot with the Baz group. And now you leaped into, hey, I'm just going to actually go do this, <laughs> do this. Thing. Right. I'm, I'm curious, what's been the biggest challenge so far in standing up a fintech? Well, I think that my challenges have been so much different than uh, any other fintech founder because of that background that you mentioned. So, you know, when you look at um, like the middleware providers, like the Sinteras and Bonds and Units and all those guys, they are really interesting. They provide a really needed service for folks that don't have deep ties into the banking sector. Um, like if you don't have a bank partner and you don't know anything about compliance, that's that's perfect for you, right? Um, th- those were not my problems, right? I, I know a lot of banks. <laughs> mm-hmm. I know I know a lot about- 70 you know, plus of them, you know. Oh, the, yeah. at least. I mean, I interviewed- hundreds of bankers at bank director for not just stories, but to build out the Finex tech. So like I had a lot of like the r- more rare, I think knowledge when it comes yep. to like diving into something like this and building something like this. Um, for me, the biggest challenge, I mean, once I told you about what I was building, that took away a lot of challenges <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> in terms of just like having the time to, and, and brain space to like, have permission to think about these things all the time. Um, so thank you, Jason, for being the world's best boss um, and, and incubating new companies <laughs> under under your wing. Um, but, you know, I mean, fundraising clearly is a challenge and wrapping up the initial close for our pre-seed in a time when, you know, the market is going insane and tech stocks are falling like crazy um, certainly is a little bit scary and stressful. But you know, I even think that from that, we've been a little bit more insulated than others because of this very specific customer base that we're serving mm-hmm. and and the availability of, um, you know, there are so many more funds now that are dedicated to underrepresented founders, women founders, black and brown founders, uh, impact investors. So those folks have the same mandate no matter what tech stocks are doing, right? And so even there, I think we've been lucky to be a little bit insulated. So what advice would you give if you were someone who doesn't come, you know, deeply ingrained in the industry to start a fintech when they see a problem, whether it's on the business model or breaking in, what advice would you give to someone who wanted to start a fintech? I would say, make sure that you are solving a unique problem that is truly not being addressed by anyone else. I mean, I think that this is where we got to the point of saturation that we did with neobanks is there are so many that are just kind of generic digital banking products that actually don't do a lot of other things. So I think starting with the problem is always the most important thing. Like don't go build something for the sake of building it because you think you can, Um, you know, wait until you find something that's actually needs a solution, but that is also worth fighting for. What we're trying to address with Totem is something that I've felt personally that has impacted my life. Um, it's something that you know my heritage will always be a part of me, and so that's something that's not going to go away. Whether the trend is you know towards NFTs or away from Web three or like all of these different shiny things that we chase so often in fintech, um, having it having your business be something that you have personally experienced and felt and will always have a connection to, I think can go help help take you really far in the times when it feels like everything is falling apart and all of the deals are falling through and people just aren't getting it. Um, you need something that you feel really passionate about to get you through those times. So if people want to partner with Totem, they feel they have something to provide the native people or they're interested in getting on your waiting list, where can they find out more? 
Yeah. So you can find us at mytotem.app. That's my T O T E M dot A P P. And um, we are hiring also. So I will say that there's at least one, hopefully by, by the time this episode airs, several job descriptions up. Um, so yeah, we're looking for tribal partners who want to you know, work with us to get your benefits paid out, add your benefits to our platform so that people can find them easier. Obviously, love a good account holder. So if you're a native and you want to get on our account wait list, mytotem.app. Um, if you want to, if you want to work for a very mission driven company, you know, that's there for you too. And then we're, you know, we're on Twitter, um, at bank with totem and we are just getting started. So our kickoff is this week. And so, um, we'll be hopefully posting fast and furious. Um, we'll also hopefully just be a good account to follow if you want to, you know, find out more about native culture and be a supporter and an ally and an advocate for us. Fantastic. And in full disclosure, Alloy Labs is an investor through our fund in Totem. So not only did we spin Amber out, spin her up, but we are investors. So good luck, Amber, and excited to see this mission continue. Thank you so much, Jason. Appreciate you having me. It's fun to be on this side of the mic. (laughs) (laughs) That's it for this week. If you like the show, make sure to give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform or share it with a friend or share it on social media. We'll see you again next week with more Breaking Banks.